athletics. I think that's one of the biggest roadblocks that even elite athletes struggle with is like, how can you take a situation that can be viewed in such a negative light and be like, no. all right, the only thing I can do from here is to get better. I chickened out from joining the soccer. That's why I didn't do wrestling, yeah, yeah. football, because I was scared to fail. When you take away that fear of failure, you're going to blossom like crazy. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Garage Strength Podcast. We are here with the legend, Ferris Khan. Ferris, thanks for making the trip up here. Hey, man, I appreciate it. And honestly, it's a true pleasure to be in your presence right now in this incredible gym. So I'm really excited. So I, I wanted to sort of paint the picture of how you and I started to, to talk, right? And I think that I, I just wanted to talk, one, about social media and YouTube and, and stuff like that, especially in the fitness world. And one of the cool parts for me was I think I had, I don't know if I, I think I probably commented on one of your posts, something along those lines. We ended up following each other and then it was like, Hey, um, we should try and see if we could get together. And at the time, you know, I, I knew that you were down in Virginia cause I think I, I think I trolled everything yeah, around you. you. Of- <laughs> yeah, I was like, I know where this dude is. He's not yeah, that far. Yeah. Um, and I want to say at least there was at least one time, if not twice that we're like, okay, let's try and get down there. And I, and I remember maybe it was twice. Cause I think the one time was like COVID started to it was, peak. Yeah, it was like, like 21 or something. It was 2021. I think the first time we wanted to meet. Okay. But I think we were talking a little before that as well. I think another time was around when your daughter might have been born yeah, or was exactly. about to be born. So you, you actually wanted to come to Virginia. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And yeah, my wife was like eight months. And so it was like such a risky time because I was and I like, think I had gotten COVID or something yeah, like that. I remember too. you told me that. Yeah. You just got COVID. Yeah. And it was just, I don't know, one day I could be there. One day I might be in the hospital. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. So that didn't work out. And then I, there was another time, I think earlier this year. We wanted to link up. Yes. Yeah, I think. And I had to, like, travel or something. You were in, like, four countries or something. <laughs> yeah. so. I think I think the the interesting part around that is, like, I remember, when, like, first watching your, your videos and, one, realizing, like, this dude is just, like, a springboard, like, how explosive <laughs> you are and, and, and how well you move. But then also how easily you could take a complex movement, Mm -hmm. make it appear very easy, but then also even in your description and how you were educating the public on social media, like, yo, this is what you can use this for. And then a lot of times too, like, I don't know if you still do this, but I remember back then too, you would also do like carousels. So you could almost see like progressions to points. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the biggest thing that stuck out to me was like, one, this dude's a freak, but two, he just knows how, you know, how to relate to almost everybody. And I think that that's like the one un, unsung thing around social media is like everybody puts it down and everybody says negative things about it because it, it can consume you. It can take away from things yeah, that really do yeah. genuinely matter more. For sure. But at the same time, it can create some really cool stuff. And I think that that's mm-hmm. like, I just wanted to, to throw that in there as this, you know, this meeting, us discussing this is really just because I saw you on Instagram and I was like, yo, this dude's a freak. I want to, I want to learn from you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I, I wanted to put that out there and, and let you know how much I appreciate you coming up and, and uh, for sure, man. I'm excited to, to, to pick your brain. Um, yeah. And, um, just to say too, you know, I really actually wanted to come here. It's not just like, you know, Oh, he wants me, but no, I really was excited to come because I was watching your stuff on YouTube a while ago before I'd even spoken to you. And this was just for my own education. You know, how can I build X, Y, Z? How can I get this and that? And then your videos was always coming up, you know? And so from there, I was like, wow, this guy's very knowledgeable. You know, he's got a very unique style of training, which is similar to mine. And so just together, I was like, yo, this is really cool. You know, so I'm sure you've seen a lot of my videos too. I've been inspired by yourself, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So, uh, so no, it's a true pleasure to be here. That's awesome. Um, I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. I guess, you know, I wanted to jump right into to some training questions if, you know, and so let's say let's let's pretend like um, let's say somebody comes in, they hit you up, they want to buy a program off of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's You don't work with them in person. And it's like, 
all right, this person is a high school football player. They are fat. Like they are. How about this? They're a high school football player. They're a little bit slow. Mm -hmm. Uh, They want to train four days a week. How do you initially go about problem solving and recognizing like what you can do, how you can contribute to that specific individual uh, and, and build them from, you know, point A to point B? Yeah. So I would first have to assess the athlete. You know, just taking a look at their current levels of strength, look at their power, understand what position they play and then what they really need. And so from there, you know, I'll just break things down even simpler. When we look, okay, are we in the off season? All right, cool. Let's, you know, focus on this first. And then if they're a little overweight, depending on their position, we might need to, you know, cut down a little bit. So just breaking each of those things down so that the athlete can, one, just kind of be, you know, very understanding of what he needs to do. And then two, just so we have like a solid structure. So, you know, first from the assessment, then we'll go ahead trying to just put things in some phases. And then as we get closer to competition, that's where we're really going to focus on, okay, how am I going to make him as good as possible at his position? Mm -hmm. So, you know, with four days a week, I mean, that's a lot we can do, you know, between the field work, the gym work. So, and it just obviously is going to get a little deeper depending on what, you know, how long they've been playing. If they're a freshman, they're a senior, you know what I'm saying? How experienced, how confident are they? So, and that's the thing I've seen with a lot of high school level athletes is that the experience really does play a role. Like mm-hmm. you really see freshmen come in and just be a beast instantly. It's because they do need to build not just, you know, from the performance standpoint, but also that mental and that, you know, that confidence. And so I try to instill a lot of those factors in them. So what do you think, what would be like, as you're, as you're trying to build up that, that work and get those factors implemented into their routine and and mm-hmm. let, like let's say that kid there's a kid who's in eighth grade and they say like oh, i'm in eighth grade i want to be a starter when i'm a sophomore or a freshman yeah, yeah what do you see as like the biggest roadblocks like what are the things that you know they're they're investing money into you first yeah, of all yeah. so that's a big step to for them to achieve that growth the mm-hmm. second you know after that where is it like that you see as very consistent problems that people struggle to overcome as far as making that progress. What would you say are like two or three of like the big roadblocks that you see? Yeah. Yeah. So from an eighth grader, it's nowadays it's, I see it a lot more, but previously some of those kids won't be like super motivated. It might be their parents who are like, Hey, my kid has potential come train with them. But then when I train with the kid, they're not like, you know, they're playing around or they're like, you know, not listening 100 percent. But nowadays there are eighth graders who are just like they're ready to go. You right. know, they're they show up to practice early. You know, they're eating well, sleeping well, things like that. So I think from a motivated standpoint as to how bad the kid actually wants it is one of the biggest things, because you can tell kind of instantly with kids whether they want it or whether it's their parents who want it. more yeah. type thing. Yeah, yeah. So for a kid who wants it, that makes it so much easier. Because then it's like, okay, let's focus on the things that we need. What position do you play? Oh, you're a receiver? All right, so we're going to need our speed. We're going to need that coordination. We're going to need to work on, of course, your routes, things like that. And then, of course, that's all built upon that base of, you know, having good strength and just them getting comfortable with their movement patterns. And so from there, then it just becomes fairly simple. And uh, the other question you were saying, what are the top, like, two, three you know, issues that you saw? Yeah, like seen? roadblocks, like things that's like a lot of people consistently struggle with. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'll, is it, mm-hmm. is it, maybe it is like the accountability showing up three or four days a week. Is yeah. it uh, their parents aren't supporting them? Is it, you know, so, stuff along those lines? Yeah, so I think when it does come with those younger athletes, it's more of a lot of them are distracted, you know, like, and, and this is where I can relate to them so much because, in high school, I was so distracted. Every sport I played, like, you know, obviously I did track and field. I'd be, instead of going to practice, I'd be with my friends. My friends like, hey, let's chill. I'm like, yeah, I'll chill rather than practice, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. And so I think the distraction is probably one of the biggest things. And the ones who can separate themselves from being distracted to being committed to the sport, that's the huge game changer right there. So, and then from there, I'd say another issue would probably just be just true commitment as well, you know, which kind of ties into the same thing. But it's like 
oh, my parents want me to study more and they won't even let them go to practice if they got a B on a test. Yeah. You know, I've had things where I've had some very, very good athletes and we'd work so, so, uh, so long throughout the season. And then when it comes to like the regional meet, state meet or something like that, they back off. Their parents are like, nah, he got a C. He's not allowed to compete, uh, you know, little yeah. things like that. So, you know, the parents obviously play a role when you're that young. But Okay, so you mentioned you mentioned that you struggle with being distracted in in school. Oh man. At least at least uh, like how you you set that up like okay, instead of going to practice, I chill. Anything like that. Yeah. I think that is 100%. I mean, I think that's that's a problem I still have personally, right? Like I think even adults <laughs> struggle with like distraction on different levels. You know, it might yeah. be it might be you want to hang out and just chill. It might be you want to party. It might be um you know, you, you don't even know what your passion is. And I guess that that's as soon as you said that, I felt like a lot of people, I mean, one, because I can relate to it, but I feel like a lot of people can genuinely acknowledge like I do. I do struggle with that distraction. So what is it or what was it? Um, and also me just from the outside mm -hmm. with your posting um, and and how well like you're dialed in with your with the business and with your movement patterns it's like is there one thing that you would say like got you on the straight and narrow is it one thing that or is it mo a, mo a multitude of uh, different habits that you've instilled to really get you uh to be i guess less distracted really yeah yeah so honestly i still even struggle with certain distractions you know i think just naturally as a human we're always going to have like something that's either right there in our ear or something that's like in our head that takes us maybe not even a hundred percent away from what we want to do but something that could take time away in a less productive way so i think for me what the big change was was the fact that i really do enjoy what i'm doing and i wanted to bring it to a level and i knew that it wasn't going to get there with with no work so you know instead of for example like in the past I would, you know, instead of going home, trying to work on business, work on ideas and stuff like that, I might go play some video games, some chess, you know, I might <laughs> be like, oh, I got to stimulate my mind. Let me play some chess or, you know, whatever, some PlayStation. And then I look at it and it's just like, Yo, what am I actually doing? You know, like this, I know I have a gift and a passion that I want to share with so many people. And I'm not going to be able to do that if I don't put in a little bit of work. And so it was kind of more of a realization about myself. And then once I'd realized that, I think the thing that truly helped me was having somebody to hold me accountable as well. One of my very good friends who also started into the fitness business, he kind of branched into something else now. But we had, you know, kind of like a little a little goal with each other. We're like, you know what, let's post on Instagram every day, give people value for 30 days straight. And whoever misses a day got to do, you know, they they fall off, you know, whatever. Yeah. Since then, I was so consistent, and then I think I went, like, two years straight without, like, with posting every single day. And then from there, that's when I saw, like, the true growth. That's when I saw, you know, people started to come reach out to me about, hey, can you help me with this, help me with that? And then that's where I just started, you know what, let me actually go full force with this. Right. That's so. that's that's good. That's That, that actually, I'm going to share this real quick where... It's, it's funny how, okay, so you're talking about the business side and it's like, all right, I'm going to post every day for 30 days. I think, I think as athletes and, and I was going to share this quick story where when I met with John Meadows and he talked to me about, yo, you got to go full steam on, on YouTube. And he had said, he was like, look, after I was like five or six months in, I went every day. I think his was 40 days. He was like, I did, I posted a video on YouTube, a long form video every day That's for tough. 40 straight days. And, uh, Jason and I, who's our editor, um, maybe it was more so me. We were like, let's, I forget if it was 60 or 70. It was 70. <laughs> Jason's like, God, it was 70 days. <laughs> so we were like, Oh, well, if Meadows did 40, let's try 70. But I want to say we got to like 62, 63. And then we were like, all right, you know, this is good. Uh, I think, I think that that means of accountability and that means of a routine, like even though it was, we didn't see a ton of growth off the channel at that time. It was just this 
constant process that like sort of like in my mind and jason might disagree i feel like it it, it catapulted my confidence on camera and my confidence to yeah, and it to, builds to plan habits. yeah yeah and those habits then translate longer term and i think that even like at the high school level or the collegiate level if if someone's listening what they can do to as a takeaway is literally like do mobility for 30 straight days just do it yeah do do a shoulder shoulder stretch a hip stretch an ankle stretch for 30 straight days mm -hmm. and and tell me when when those 30 days are over that you're in a worse spot than you were that exactly. previous 30 days and it's like now they do that and then they can they can do one one more thing they can add in all right, I'm going to go to the gym. It doesn't mean you're going to lift heavier or, or mm -hmm. that you're going to do anything. Or I'm going to go to the track and I'm going to do maybe one day's technique, maybe one day's mobility. Maybe one yeah. day I'm doing there hard sprints, whatever it is. It's taking that. And now all of a sudden that's instilling that, that habitual work ethic, which is really what happens and it compounds. And that mm -hmm. ends up being like, all of a sudden it's like, Oh, well I had 30 days here. Now I'm jumping here yeah, and another, true. now you're at 60 days. Oh shit. Well, then I, you know, it just keeps adding up and, and adding you up. know, it's just a daily routine. It's not know? even a, there's no friction around it. Exactly. It's just, it's so smooth and, and so uh, easy to get it done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's, I, I think that's something that, that I will, I, I, I know I'm going to keep saying this is like just following from afar. Like it, it comes out in, in your videos. And I feel like, I think it's also something where you, you can take these complex movements and these complex ideas and you simplify them. And, and when someone can simplify something complex, that also shows like there's, there's some authority there. Like there's some work ethic and habits behind it. Um, I wanted to bring up some stuff around training specifically Mm -hmm. um how do you because i feel like i i mean this is my internal feeling is like we're might we might be looked at as like we lift pretty heavy mm -hmm. and you're looked at as like the speed guy or like the explosive speed guy yeah yeah and i guess is there do you see a point to ever lift heavy um, and, or how do you balance even like if you had a, somebody using a track example mm -hmm. or a running back, whatever, how would you balance in, in your case, let's say weight room work versus mm -hmm. sprint base work? Yeah. So honestly, and this is, this is really going to be very individualized to who I'm working with or just what that person's level of strength is. But it's a thing where if I can see that somebody doesn't have a good base of strength, then they're going to be very limited with how much gains they're going to see on the track or with their speed, mm -hmm. you know, because having that base of strength allows you to train, you know, your rate of force development. It allows you to actually train all the other qualities that are going to make you faster. And so I'll look at it, somebody, if I, if I see that, okay, this person is pretty weak, you know, his patterns are all off, things like that, then I might put a little bit more focus into getting that person stronger. And of course, I'm never going to get away from, you know, the sprinting and stuff like that. But it's a thing where we might put we have to put more emphasis in an area like our maximal strength. And then we'll wa start working into some power. And then once I see that, okay, this person has a good base of strength now, they're looking a lot more powerful. We'll look at the other qualities like their reactive strength. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll take them through some plyos. How are they bouncing off the ground? Are they pretty elastic? Or do they just kind of sit on the ground and, you know, all the energy is getting lost? So from there, that's where like you just mentioned, I can break things down. You know, I was like, okay, so we're not at this level, but we're going to work, you know, a little bit, you know, here. Once we get the hang of this, then we're going to get a little bit faster, do some more velocity-based movements. And then ultimately, you know, whenever they're at competition time, really ramp up to just get them as fast as possible. So, you know, that's kind of an all-around answer right there. Right, but right. It's uh, if, if I'm trying to balance something, I'm just first looking at where are they, you know? Mm -hmm. So like it's again, if somebody's not strong enough, then I'm not going to have them just do plyos like three times a week or twice a week, even just because like they're not even getting the full benefit from it. Right. Versus the opposite. If somebody has a great base of strength, then they're the ones who I see are more suited to do those plyos, to do the ballistic training, to do, you know, more complex training methods. And so, you know, from there, I can just easily build it up. Yeah, so you'd say essentially what you're saying is like you've got to have a base of max strength. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's some 
and maybe individually there there might be some there's might be some people that that max strength has to be bigger because they're not as athletic or potentially not as mm -hmm. coordinated and then some people they might get to a certain level and you notice oh like once they got to this level well now we they're handling these jumps a little bit better so now we can actually possibly back off of the strength aspect and actually apply a little bit more of like the speed work or the the jumping stuff or anything along those lines is that accurate or yeah yeah pretty much okay. you know and and it's a thing too where it's like everybody's going to be so different right you know it's like i have some people who will train exactly the way i do but you know i'm responding way different than them and then i'm just looking at them like all right because you know you're not you don't want to skip steps you yeah. know yeah. so let's let's take it down a bit and then you know once you exhibit some good form with you know x y and z we can head back to where we were so i want to ask this this is going back to you personally Mm -hmm. what was your background like did you play sports growing up like give walk us through like ferris con <laughs> zero to 14 oh man so zero to 14 so it's uh i actually did not play sports like growing up and this is a thing too where you know i don't i'm not sure why like my parents they didn't put me in it they just thought i wasn't cut out for it you know <laughs> They never was, saw your jumping videos. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I was, so I was actually like always very tiny. I was such a small guy. And so, you know, my older brother, he would play like basketball and I would like, I'd be like, yo, I want to play too. But I guess my mom's like, nah, he's way too small. He's got to get crushed, you know. Are you the Whatever. baby? Are you the youngest? I'm, I'm the middle. Oh, okay, the okay, middle. okay. But my younger brother is bigger than me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's why she was like, I guess, fearful. Yeah. So I did do Taekwondo though. Okay. So in Taekwondo, I, I loved it. You know, I loved uh, the sparring, you know, hitting hard. I actually got all the way to black belt. Okay. And that's the only, like, form of activity, organized activity that I did. You know, of course, I would play outside a lot, run, ride bikes, you know, four square, like the yeah. random things that we used to do. And it wasn't until high school, freshman year, when I was about 14 there. But that's when I did, like, okay, let me play some sports. So I wanted to try out for the soccer team, but... I did not touch a soccer ball my whole life. So imagine <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm trying to go up against guys that have great ball control. Yeah. Like even just Skills. simple things. Exactly. Like I had no skill. So just simple things like passing the ball with accuracy from here to there. I was like, yo, what am I doing here? <laughs> so I went through like the whole like training camp. And then the day came for tryouts. I chickened out. didn't do it. And, you know, my brother, he was a wrestler. And so I was like, you know what? Let me do this with my brother, you know, because, you know, we can train together. I remember seeing how big people were and I was like, yo, I can't do this either. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and then I kind of gave it a rest uh, for, with everything for a while. Sophomore year, I did track and field, but that was just more of me being social. Like I was doing it cause friends were doing it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to practice like that. There was no cuts and I was really, really slow. I was running like a 12.4 or a 12.300 meter dash, which <laughs> is pretty bad. Yeah. And uh, junior year, again, didn't take anything serious. Senior year is when I took things serious. And this is where, you know, when you're a senior, things are a little late in terms of, like, where you can do things after that. But that's when I wanted – I played – I did track and field again. And from there, I was like, okay, let me really, like, go hard with this. So I remember that uh, junior year – or going back to junior year, I remember it was the state meet, right? Or not even the state meet. It was the district meet. And yeah. all I had to do in the 100 meter was to not get last. And I was like, okay, cool. I can do that. It's like nine of us in the heat. I ended up getting last place. And because of that, our team didn't advance to like, you know, the region or whatever. And so that was my junior year. And that was me just being very silly, you know, going to McDonald's before, before practice, you know, whatever. Senior year, like I was saying, that's where I went very serious. And that's where I was like, you know what? I'm doing whatever I can to be the fastest I can jump the best I can, whatever. And that's actually the first year that I did do things like long jump and triple jump. Okay. And I actually ended up breaking the school records in both. And I was like so invested at that point. And, but I was a senior and it was like, by that state meet, I'd broken the school record. And then it was like, now what? You know, I'm not even, I wasn't even going to a school that had a track program. So, you know, I, I could definitely see where, you know, my distractions took me away from like what it could have been right but right. you know i'm very thankful for that because now i have like such a great understanding and i can help so many people you know who are kind of like trying to get to somewhere not follow my footsteps exactly but 
teach them from my mistakes. Yeah, I think that's a that's like the biggest point is like taking, you know, the way you laid out like that, um, almost like embarrassment, and then looking at it as like, yes, that that would be a failure, it'd be a problem or whatever. But in instead of l really digesting it as a problem, it was more like, all right, let's take this as an opportunity to grow. Yeah. It's like if yeah. we can take this embarrassment point take it a little bit like hey this is embarrassing but then afterwards saying like how can we look at it more so as an opportunity to blossom from mm -hmm. and i think that's like i think that's one of the going back to that question about roadblocks i think that's one of the biggest roadblocks that even elite athletes struggle with is like how can you take a how can you take a, a situation that can be viewed in such a negative light and be like, yeah. all right, the only thing I can do from here is to get better. That's yeah. it. And that's literally the reason why I chickened out from joining the soccer. That's why I didn't do wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. Football because I was scared to fail. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then that's why I, I love track. Cause it's like, okay, it's an individual sport. Yep. If, if I lose, it's on me. But then when they needed me, I was nowhere to be found. I was right. You know? And so when you take away that fear of failure, you're going to blossom like crazy. You know that, it, yeah, that that's really. I mean, that's the biggest thing. I okay. Literally. So here, I'm gonna get even deeper now. Yeah. Take that. Come to you're 32 now. 31. 31. Yeah. And you've got a kid and you got a family. Well, how does that make you feel? Where it's like everything's on you. You know, I I truly love pressure right yeah, now. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like before, like you talked to me like five years ago, I'd be like, oh no, nah, I gotta chill for a sec. That pressure makes me better. You know, because I know, especially like, you know, being in this space as an entrepreneur and you got to be able to sell yourself and this and that. I know that if I chill out too much, then where's my house going to go? You know, yeah. how's yeah, the yeah. food going to come? Right. You know, so that pressure is what actually pushes me a little bit more. And of course, like you, you want to be able to build yourself up to a level where it's like you're not just going to crumble under it. But every little failure or mistake is a learning lesson and it's yeah. a way for you to just get, become better. So that's how I look at it. Do you think, uh, do you think, do you feel when you're, when your child was born, did that add any, not maybe not even necessarily pressure, but like willingness to handle the, the, the pressure, willingness to embrace it more. So did that yeah, add anything? Of course, you know, because like I, I want to be, you know, very present for her, you know, and I know that, the things she knows about, you know, specific things I want to teach her. It's going to come from me, you know, right. first and foremost, that learning is going to come from her parents. And it's like, if I can't be the best I can be for her, then it's like, I'm almost setting her up for like not optimal success, you know? Yeah. Yep. And, you know, that's why I want to, you know, expose her to some different things, teach her right from wrong, have her, you know, grow in a way where she can, you know, still figure things out on her own, but also just have that good support system. So, definitely makes me better 100 percent. Right. right okay so back to the training <laughs> um let's say you know we talked i mean we have we've talked a little bit off off air about plyometric stuff is there any specific like let's say a strength exercise or plyometric movement that it, you've been like no matter what no if ands or buts this one or two movements whatever it is always works this always is going to get somebody stronger yeah so from a plyo standpoint i gotta go with the hurdle hops and i love the hurdle <laughs> yeah, hops yeah and why i will echo so that i will 100 percent echo that oh yeah and the good thing about the hurdles too is that they're so you can easily make it either a lot easier or mm -hmm. much more difficult mm -hmm. you know you can start with hurdles like that's like barely off the ground you know like yep. a couple inches yep. then you can go up to hurdles that are above your hips you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and just the reactive strength that it builds the coordination the rhythm and just having that external obstacle right in front of you forces you to put out some high effort mm -hmm. otherwise you kind of go tumbling to the ground you know yeah so i definitely would always i'm gonna always do hurdle hops hopefully if I make it to 80 years old, I'll still You're be still doing, doing them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like Jason, I feel like you, like, you, as an athlete, always reacted well with hurdle hops. I don't know why, but I always felt like even when we were peaking, like, you in high school, it was like, if we would just, I don't know why. I don't think you used hurdle hops that much when I was in high school. Really? 
No, I feel like I didn't start doing them until I moved back here after college. Uh, Okay. Maybe I'm just making all that up in my head. (laughs) I mean, I felt good with them when I could do them well. I know throwers-wise, though, it's like any time we're leading into peaking, but not even just that. It's like body control. And the other big factor, too, is like, like having that obstacle. It's like the first time someone gets over a hurdle and then the first time they hit the hurdle and go again like make it over and go again it's like it's like a light bulb goes off in their body like oh shit i'm athletic like i can do this i can (laughs) produce force and it can just you know jump get them to jump i mean no pun intended but to actually have that 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 greater confidence what about uh what about like a strength movement uh like lower body or just in general in general yeah so i mean you can't go wrong with any of the compounds to be Mm -hmm. honest uh, like personally, like if I'm looking at training for someone and someone I say like, look, you always got to do one of these. I would say, which I would say a trap bar is probably one of my favorites simply because you can manipulate it in so many different ways. And it's like a squat, but you still get, you know, some of the deadlift benefits mm-hmm. to it. Mm-hmm. And so I love that for overall, like your lower body development. You can, a lot of trap bars, you can even flip it so you can get more range of motion. You can lunge with them. Lunge with them, yeah. do single leg variants. You mm-hmm. can do, um, to be honest, you can even, if you get super creative, I know you've probably seen some guys on, on Instagram who be pressing with it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doing carries with it, you yeah. know, little things like that. But uh, but I definitely would keep on like that as from lower body development. And then upper body, just I got to love the pull-up, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I mean, I love bench. I love stuff like that. And I still always do those. But pull-ups, everyone got to be able to do that. I feel like I feel like one of the first videos I've seen, I remember seeing of you, I feel like you were doing muscle-ups. <laughs> and it looked like it was just like, you weren't even kipping n- nothing. You were just like, oh, this is easy. And I think, like, that makes sense, pull-ups, you know? Like, I, I think pull-ups to me is like the back squat of, of the upper body. It's the best yeah. that you can do. Um, I wanted to I wanted to bring up mainly for the audience because we we talked about this a couple of days ago where you had mentioned the offset trap bar deadlift. And I mm-hmm. personally remember going to Phil Daru, going to see Phil, and he talked about it and I was like, I don't know, I don't know if I would do that because I I feel like it puts your back in a bad position. And then you mentioned this, like you love doing it. And like now i'm sitting here going like why did i always just have this this thing like blocking like i can't do a uh an alternate stance uh trap bar deadlift and it's like as soon as i lift legs on sunday the first thing i'm going to be doing is going to be trap bar deadlift (laughs) with that split foot yeah because i never even gave it a gave it a a, the time of day really and i think that that's a another big factor of like listening and being around people with different training backgrounds is like dude, you can learn, you can learn more. You, there's so much to learn around these movement patterns uh, and so many benefits, especially, you know, even with you saying around the trap bar deadlift, like, honestly, I didn't really start using them probably until last year with the throwers. We did them for like two blocks in a row. And it was like, mm-hmm. wow, this is, a, it's a little bit easier on their back than, than a heavy back squat. They don't yeah. feel as beat up the next day. They throw a little bit better. And it's like, well, maybe we should do this a little more. So, yeah. And yeah, no, I love it too, even from an aspect where if you are doing a lot of plyometrics and you do a lot of things that put some more stress on your joints, the trap bar is very low stress. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. It's something that you can, it's it's not going to be bad for you as long as your form isn't bad. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so. I feel like it's a quick learning curve where it's like, oh, absolutely. It's pretty easy to get in and to execute it with, with decent technique, like basically like right away. Of course. And it's not for, especially even for like some newer lifters. It's not one of those super intimidating looking yeah. exercises, you know, yeah. and it's like back squat. I back squat too, front yeah. squat. I do all of it. But, you know, for somebody who's never lifted, they're like, yo, I got to put all of that on my back, you know. Yeah. like, And then they're like, like getting it on their back and they're yeah. cringing. It's like, ah. Exactly. So, and, it, and it's not something that like I'll never do that with them, but it's a thing where it's like, okay, if you're, let's say, constrained, like maybe with time or something, and then, you know, you can slowly build up. Then it's like, all right, let's start with something that they're a little comfortable with, and then we can, you know, develop off of that. So, okay, before we get into any uh, audience questions, I wanted to ask you, who would be like three or four, let's say three or four social media, or even just people that you've come across, you've met 
that have influenced you the most in the realm of sports performance? Man, that's a great question. Um, I mean, straight up, definitely garage strength. Um, yeah. <laughs> I got to be honest, you know, garage strength, 100% there. And uh, there's a there's a lot. It's uh, back in the day. This was even before the IG. I was big into like Kelly Starrett okay, type yeah. dude, you yeah. know, with the mobility stuff. Yep. Used to go deep into his videos, like 11 years old type stuff. And uh, more performance side, I do like... Uh, this guy Shea Pierre, Pierre's Elite Performance, yeah. great dude yeah, yeah. from Canada. Yeah. He's got a bunch of speed drills. I use a lot with some of my athletes too. So the the list is long, you know, but definitely taking like the mobility aspect from one, the speed aspect, and then just you know overall like creativity and just the strength and everything from certain people right there. Yeah, that's a good list. Shea Pierre was like one of the first places that I started to look outside of what we were doing on youtube and was looking at his stuff like almost for like a model on, on youtube early on like what is he mm -hmm. doing that we're not doing like <laughs> trying to trying to pull from it a, a bit more yes okay jason okay yeah so we do got some questions and to start off we got our boy keist with the first question of the keist. day keist what's up uh, so this is actually a question I think we're touching up on the live stream on Tuesday, so I'll save that for then. But uh, he has another question, of just a general, and I think for both of you, and I'm not sure how much you utilize this movement, uh, Ferris, but like, how do you increase the bench press? Like, What do you think uh, are good variations? Just kind of general tips on improving the bench press. Didn't didn't you post a video like recently about <laughs> yeah, that? <laughs> we just post like two. Yeah, we yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I, just, I feel like I just saw a video yeah, about we you did. doing that. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I do utilize it as well. So, you know, what what I would do, and this is something where I'm not. My goal isn't to bench more. You know, first of all, I'm just I do it because it's such a great compound movement for the upper body. But I I do. I do section it in a way where it's like I'll do some heavy reps, you know, sometimes like five sets of one, you know, with a lot of rest in between. And then I'll do, you know, some that are a little lighter, like three sets of three. And then I'll put volume on it towards the end. And I did this once a week for a long time. This is years ago. And that's really what blew my bench up. And um, I'm sure you can go way deeper in it. But that from my personal experience, that helped tremendously and i was benching for like 30 minutes you know when you do all that yeah with the yeah, rest. yeah so i think that's what i was just gonna say is like how long do you want to commit to it is exactly, it yeah. is it we want to get a bench up just that's our you know we want to basically ba base the entire program the entire workout at least that day around the bench uh and if that's if that's your goal that's fine so it's like I, I wanted to point out, like, I mean, we, we've done some stuff with pauses. We've done a lot of stuff with different bars. We've done a lot of stuff more work with on an incline bench. And we basically have, like, 50 ways that we can increase a bench. And we sort of go through, like, the, the easiest way to the hard way. And then once, you know, once you have multiple people, like, I'm, I'm thinking about our throwers. Like, we've got probably four or five guys that can bench over 500 now. So it's like, once they get over 500, it's like, that's when it gets really challenging to keep mm -hmm. bumping it. And it's, that's when I like to use crazy stuff. I was actually just talking, Dan Maroney reminded me, he's a buddy of mine that has a gym in Massachusetts. And he was, he was saying to me, he's like, remember this. There's one thing that we did in the past. Cause he used to work for me here. He's like, mm -hmm. he brought in what he called, um, hypertrophy cluster sets so dan maroney would say you do a hypertrophy cluster sets and let's say you do this twice a week for three to four weeks mm. and you're doing like eight sets of five for like okay eight sets of five but you're only getting 30 to 45 seconds rest in between each set oh, wow. so you're using like 75 to 80 percent of your max and you're mm. going like ham and then after three weeks of doing the hypertrophy cluster sets then you drop down to a traditional cluster set. So maybe you're doing like 10 doubles with 30 to 60 seconds rest and you're doing a lot more volume. And then you go another three to four weeks where you back out and you do like maybe like traditional ramping like on a pyramid where you're doing like two triples, two doubles, and then three singles to a max. And then you might might do like a couple drop sets off of that. So mm -hmm. I just talked to Dan about this today. So that was something I wanted to share where he and I were 
you know, going through some of the old stuff that, that we were doing. I actually mentioned to him that you were, that you were here and he just chimed back like, yo, remember, remember when we, we tried this hypertrophy cluster set. So it's something that like, you know, it just depends on how much time you want to spend on it. And I think yeah. if you're in a, the realm of sports performance, it's like there's certain, there's certain positions or sports that will need more of a bench press, like mm -hmm. targeted training session. And then there's other sports where it's like, I mean, yeah, we need to like build a bench just to have like a, a stable shoulder region. But like, you don't want to spend more than 15 minutes on it because yeah. it could take away from other qualities that you're trying to develop. Yeah, no, nah, 100% I agree with that. So this next one comes from uh, Wyatt Boone. Uh, what would you guys recommend for exercises to improving your athleticism for hockey? And I'm going to assume that this is ice hockey. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good. And I'm pretty sure you probably made a video on this too, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I feel like you've hit every sport, yeah. you know. Uh, so that's ice hockey is one of those things where it's like, okay, how can I train on land? Because, like, do I want to do these things in skates? But the thing is, you're still utilizing those same muscles. Like, for example, you're skating side to side. You're still pushing, using your glutes. You're still utilizing, you know, that hip extension and all those same elements that we're looking at. So I would train it just like how I would. You know, I would go do uh, some certain things where I'm moving in the different planes that we're going to focus on while we're on the ice or even if it is field. And, you know, just building that good base and then allowing yourself to do some of those more athletic style movements. And then, of course, like just the sta stability factor of it, you know, a lot of unilateral work, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of I know I know a lot of coaches don't like that instability work so much. But when you look at hockey, you are kind of unstable, you know, yep. so you can add a little bit of that, too, just to help with those specific elements. And then that performance stuff just, of course, being very stable. Yeah, I would echo that. I would start with. um I know there's there's been some research with front squat related to uh, short track speed skating. So I would actually start there. I would going back with what Ferris has talked about in, earlier in the podcast was assessing. So if we can assess an individual that comes in and say like, all right, well they they can only, they can only front squat 135 pounds or something, and they're a male, I would try to build that up a little bit just based off that research. But then try to focus a lot on single leg squats, uh, single leg front squats, skater squats, um, pistol squats to a point even, uh, and try and really develop the, the strength unilaterally. And then how we would set up the program would be, you know, one day a leg day like that where we're building that strength. And then at least one day of what we'll, we call athlete day where we're doing like plyometrics on various planes. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of very hard stops in hockey so i would um try to use actually i i, I gotta talk to you about this plyometric framework that i want to uh that we're gonna have to go over tomorrow in the, yeah, yeah. the summit but i i would use a lot of explosive jumps that then require a stop mm -hmm. another jump stop another jump stop and then maybe somewhere where you would without stopping you would just work right through it so i think that getting creative with the jumps um, and then while building that foundation of strength, uh, that's how, that's exactly the, you know, the echo Ferris, that's where I'd be rolling. Awesome. So we'll move on to this one's from Ian Locke. How often should I train overloading eccentrics and how long should I rest be in between sets? overloading eccentrics like yeah. like uh eccentric hooks like we're we're doing eccentric hooks at least the way i i would take that would be we're doing hooks we're doing i mean or you're doing negatives just traditional negatives i would say like so that's why i was wondering like okay, if it's so, like a hundred plus percent negatives okay so when i was in high school we did a lot of this because we had no idea what we were doing <laughs> and we would just read any magazine you know, the, there's a grocery store here that in, in town that was, that's called Redner's. Okay. I'm going to give a little story about how we got into negatives and eccentric loading. And we would just buy, like my dad would let us buy like muscle fitness or flex, like these old school bodybuilding magazines. So uh, we would read through and just be like, Oh, we can do this. We can try this. We can try this. And the, there was an article about doing negatives and you would do negatives for like a set of three, but you'd have 
partners on the side who then, then lift it up. Shit. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then you do it again. And you would do that, and then you'd rest like two to three minutes, and then you do a normal set. Um, and long story short, we also had this – there's a shot putter named Werner Gunther, and Werner Gunther has this like training video that's just like – world famous from the late 80s and he's just got this mullet he's this huge guy that does bounds up the steps so some a lot of people have probably seen that footage he also had clips of him doing heavy uh negatives as well as other isometric stuff so we started to play around with this now what you know after we did this for about six to eight weeks every there was five of us that were training okay all of us started to get super, super tight pecs, like just really, really tight pecs. Uh, and when I went to college, I told my collegiate strength coach about this like six to eight week time frame. He's like, dude, you're lucky you never blew out a pec or anything <laughs> like that. Up, yeah. So so I think I think the, the thing with something like eccentric uh, overloading, I really believe, especially in a, a lift like the bench press, it's a tool that I would use like, way further out when someone like like there's so many things that you can do if you bench under 315 or if you bench under 405 like there's so many easier things on your body that you can put into a system to get your bench to grow now i know he's not specifying bench press so i think that would just be one thing to be aware of um yeah and I, i i agree with you what i would say too is that you got to understand what is the goal you're trying to get out of it, you know, because it is a lot of stress on the body. Yeah. It's going to make you crazy sore. You know, I know there's research that does show that that focusing on eccentric is going to help with, you know, hypertrophy, but it is going to take you out for a couple of days, you know? Yeah. So your rest period, especially if you're doing like multiple sets, you're really overloading it, you're going to be crazy sore and not only on your body, but also for your CNS, you know? Yeah. So then if you're an athlete who's also playing a sport, you got to keep that in mind. It's like, okay, maybe, you know, my upper body is super sore, but I can still go to the field, right? But your nervous system also is taxed. So, you know, it's one thing too. You got to look at like, okay, what is my main purpose that I'm trying to achieve behind this? And then how to properly put that into your schedule. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Now, to answer his question like directly, <laughs> I would say I wouldn't go above, like I know uh, Charles Poliquin would say don't go above like 120 to 125% of the max. I know some people will will say like go to 140. Let's say you have 125% of your max on and when the hooks come off, now you're down at like 80% of your max. Uh, I think that's reasonable. I would take three to four and a half minutes of rest in between sets, but I also would just really try and figure out when it w- – is there a three to six week time frame in the entire year where you're just training and you're not doing any other field based or skilled based work? Okay. So I think we'll do like two more. Um, we'll do one more from Chad and then I actually have one for, uh, for Ferris following this. Um, oh, cool. so this one is from, s- <laughs> sorry, uh, Squidward Tortellini. <laughs> oh, Squidward. Tortoli- oh, sorry. Squidward Tortellini. Squidward Tortellini. What's up, Squidward? <laughs> um, how do you how how do you guys uh, work to try to fix muscular imbalances in athletes? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, that's that's a great one. Now, to be honest, it's one thing where I think a lot of people think they have an imbalance when sometimes they really don't. Like I used to think that you know my right leg is so much weaker than my left, and then I looked at it in a sense that it is a dominant versus recessive thing too. Like, I'm right-handed, my left hand, I could barely throw a ball, you know? I'm like, I can barely even write my name, you know? So that dominant versus recessive is always going to have a little factor. So you might have slight differences. Now, if we're talking imbalance, like, it's very noticeable. Like, you can't even, like, it's a one leg, you're doing crazy weights, and the other leg, you're barely doing anything. Then that's something where it's like, okay, let's do a little bit more unilateral stuff. You know, the unilateral work is always going to be key, especially if you are an athlete. But putting emphasis on that where you're doing your single leg squats, so your single leg this, your single arm stuff, and just throughout every single limb, you can, you know, section things off. That's one way where you can specifically focus there. But, yeah, just focus and just remember, too, that dominant versus recessive. So you're not going to be able to 100% get that recessive one where the dominant one is, but you can make good gains at it. Yeah, I, I, dude, I think that's like the perfect answer where I would throw in like 
you're so on with the whole thing of like, oh, well, this is this is a huge structural imbalance. And like people will go through all these tests and they have a structural imbalance. And this will come from oftentimes when I talk to we use a, a guy named Mobility Doc and he'll be he'll say like, honestly, like most of this stuff can just get fixed by like you do controlled squats, you pause in the hole, you come up fast, you know, you focus on dumbbell pressing and, and, mm -hmm. and proper movement patterns there. You do unilateral work and a lot of these things can iron themselves out. Now, if you are, you know, you get injured or you, and, and you get, you know, you're in a, uh, uh, some type of, uh, destabilized situation where, or you, you have a, not destabilized, but you have like a, a cast on or something like that. And you develop some type of in, uh, inconsistency from side to side you would go see in my mind you should go see someone that is like a physical therapist you work on mm -hmm. on that stuff while also focusing on really dialing dialing in that proper movement in your compound lifts um yeah i i think too it's just being aware of of the that my muscle connection like some people will say like oh well that's not real but then it's like all right well if i have a weightlifter who hits a split position and they rotate one way and then if I just tell them like, yo, you're rotating hard to your right in the next split, I want you to think about stabilizing the left shoulder a little bit more. Well, now all of a sudden they hit that and they stabilize it a little bit more. Is it, they just weren't really aware that they were doing it, you know? And I think that that's like another factor. So I would say like hit the compound movements, like properly focus on unilateral training, recognize that dumbbell movements go a really long way. And then if things are really bad because you got hurt or injured in some sense, a physical therapist, you know, or, or like a mobility specialist can help quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, my question for Ferris is when you get an athlete, what would you say, or even just kind of what you've seen online or like just generally like before you get athletes and you start working with them to really improve their uh, athletic performance, what would you say are like the most common mistakes you see kids kind of training, like in their training or like whether or not how it's, how they're strength training, if they're doing any resistance training, what do you kind of notice as the common themes that like you, you get with an athlete and that you help them develop? Yeah. So one of the biggest issues, especially if it is like a kid who doesn't really know how to structure a program is that, they're either just going into the gym and doing anything like they're just like, oh, today I'll hit, you know, a squat and a bench press and then some bicep curls and then maybe a, a couple jumps. So it's having no structure or just training exactly like what you're not trying to become. Like people will say, yo, I want to get better for this happens a lot, especially with like soccer, for example, just had a dude uh, maybe like three days ago who said this and he was like, I want to get faster. I want to make it to, you know, the highest league. And I was like, okay, what do you, how's your training look like? It was a basic bodybuilding split, you know, and, you know, rep ranges just to build muscle and, you know, not putting any sort of time into sprinting or any plyometrics. And so when I look at that, I'm like, okay, well, we got to definitely shift that because if you want to get better at a specific skill, such as speed, then you're going to have to train it. So I'd say that's probably one of the biggest issues there. And then another thing is the kids who do a little too much. And a lot of people have this mindset where it's like they want to go to the gym and not be able to walk afterwards. And I'm like, OK, but then how are you going to go play your sport? It's like the CrossFit mindset almost. Yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, so these guys are killing themselves in the gym, super <laughs> sore, can barely walk to do their practice. And then they wonder why they're not performing well. And, you know, that's the thing, too. It's like you can have effective workouts and still feel good right afterwards, you know? And and then there's a whole bunch of other issues. I think the other biggest one is everything outside the gym. Are you sleeping well? Are you eating enough, you know? Oh, you're just having candy, sleeping three hours a night. Well, that's why you're not making the, getting the results that you wish to see. And so I think just building around, you know, each of those and just making that known that if you really wanna make progress with this, you gotta really focus on these things and then we can start to see a little bit. That's good, guys. Before we uh, wrap up here, I do want this new this question just came in um, from MCX, and I think you guys could help this person out. I am a volleyball player. I train six days a week. How can I increase my vertical during the season uh, through practice days? Uh, because I can't seem to gain inches during the season. Mm. 
talk yeah. to your <laughs> talk to your sport coach about jumping less <laughs> on at least one of those days. I, I think honestly, I think oftentimes when athletes are in season, it's like they're just doing so much. It's almost what you had just talked about, where it's yeah. like they're if they're training at least five days a week or practicing four or five days a week, and then they have games two of those other days. It's like the first thought thought that goes through my mind is decreasing volume or improving your ability to recover. So try to get more sleep, try to eat more protein. Um, and is, and then can they shift one of those training days, you know, maybe in some sense to either uh, plyometric and a more intensive plyometric, or even like a little bit of strength and stability work to help them uh, then create greater co-contractions, which ideally will help them jump more. So I think it would be like, assessing and figuring out that situation specific to volleyball yeah no nah, definitely i completely agree with that and when you're in season training as much as this person is then when do you when are you going to have time to actually focus on those elements so like dane was saying try to find a day where you're putting in a little bit less you know that way you can actually focus on improving some things like you know how are you reacting off the floor or just like a little bit of that strength work so that you can get a bit more benefit from some plyos here. And yeah, in season is tough, you know, it's tough, but you know, you can definitely do it as long as that structure is in place, figuring out just like you were saying, how to recover better, you know? So just keep going with it and you got this. Yeah, that's right. MCX. I feel like I remember MCX from last week's podcast, by the way, or last week's live. That's awesome. So uh, guys, are, are you doing anything tomorrow? Yes, yeah, so tomorrow we have our virtual summit here at Garage Strength. Ferris Khan is going to be presenting along with myself. We're going to have four presentations and then a Q&A that you guys can chime in on. Maybe it's five presentations even. If you guys want to sign up, you can click the link in our description. Head over to GarageStrength.com uh, and, and pick that up today. And we will see you in our live seminar tomorrow. And we're going to be there the entire day from noon until 5 o'clock. And we're going to close that up with a, with another sweet Q&A. So go check that out today. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Going to drop tons of knowledge on this. That's, I honestly can't wait. You know, I mean, there's so much that's going to be packed into this. So definitely click that link in the bio, guys. And let's get it. Until next time. Peace. Peace.